Good morning. Welcome to live in person and live Zoom worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. Our opening hymn this morning is number 77. Seek not afar for beauty from the gray hymnal. Feel free to spring, sing as the spirit moves you, but please only with a mask. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 77, Seek Not Afar for Beauty. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us here in person. And thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom, where we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I am Linda Van Voris. Uh, I am a committee of actually none. I'm actually on the board. Um, and I will be your worship associate today. Other members of the worship committee you will hear from include Alec Peck singing our hymns and Grace Prius who will welcome our new members. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart and with muted electronic devices, please. We come together this morning to remind us We come together this morning to remind one another that we are connected in mystery and miracle, awareness and gratitude. We have come to this time. Excel is just opening up, Alex. Nice of it, but let me see if I can't close it. There we go. Sorry, I'll just do that next time. We have come to this time and place to explore different spiritual perspectives together, develop a faith, develop a faith that is personally meaningful, and to bring our gifts of love and service to this community. Sorry, it opened up again. My hands weren't even on it this time. I'm afraid we're just going to have to admire this Excel spreadsheet here. It's you. <laughs> okay. 
Grace is entertaining us this I morning. I don't even use Excel. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even near the, the mouse and it's doing it. <laughs> there is, excuse us, there is a ghost in the computer that must be expunged. We'll have that done in just a minute. I actually have it printed. Okay, so we're going to change this. Um, we're going to set aside the technology and we're just going to use the printed words. If you will excuse me just a minute. Okay, so we're gonna No. Thank you, Grace. Where we are. This will be a little noisy and distracted as I turn the pages, but we will continue onward. We come together this morning to remind one another that we are connected in mystery and miracle awareness and gratitude. We have come to this time and place to explore different spiritual perspectives together, develop a faith that is personally meaningful, and to bring our gifts of love and service to this community and to each other. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are in the sanctuary, Please keep your masks on while singing and take steps to keep each other healthy and safe. Before we move into the service, there are a few announcements we would like to share. We will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all this information, and it is also available on our website. Weekly announcements. A reminder that the November Church Council meeting will be held on the third Sunday this month. Council members, please note that this month's meeting will be held on Friday, November 18th in the annex. It's a little confusing because this says will be held on the third Sunday. And then this says it's on the Friday. So I'm assuming it's actually on the Friday. Thank you. We'll disregard the Sunday for the church council. During today's service, we will be welcoming those who have joined recently our membership. We invite all new members who have joined between 2018 to the present to be seated in the front pew for this segment. Festival of Lights, the 2022 Mission Inn Festival of Lights will be held from November 25th to December 31st. Downtown light displays will be illuminated from 5 to 10 p.m. UUCR will be open to the public during these festivities. Donations of snacks, bottled water, individual packages of hot chocolate are appreciated. Please see Robert or Avery for the details. This is actually a fundraiser for us. We will be open um, at least Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and perhaps Thursday as well, where we sell the snacks and the bottled water and the hot chocolate, and we offer coffee to lure people in. Um, also, for those who are interested, if you are a crafter, we sell people's crafts. It will be a donation um, to the church, but we also sell crafts, and for those who are interested, we sell um, inexpensive children's light toys, and if you'd like to contribute um, either well, either toys or finances for that endeavor, please see um, Kate. I'm going to let Kate. Kate's sort of in charge these days, um, or you can see me. Um, but all the, also, we will be recruiting people to help to sell. We will be open. Um, three to four days every weekend. So we we need and we need at least three people here. So um, 
once upon a time, there were a few of us doing it every night, but we've grown older and less effective. So we will only be sharing that with you, which I'm sure you would love to do because it's a lot of fun to connect up with your community and the outside community while you are doing it. So please let one of us know. Call to worship. Now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. You are welcome to read with me our call to worship. Love is a doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is a sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to live in service to humankind and all life in fellowship. Thus we do covenant. This morning, we are pleased to extend a heartfelt welcome to those of you who joined the UUR membership since 2018 to the present. We are grateful to share and expand the light of fellowship with one another and the greater community in these challenging times. At this time, Grace will come up and she will continue with the welcome. Thank you, Linda. Um, now I invite our new members who joined us between two, 2018 to the present, um, maybe in the pews behind Alec, just if you could group together. So we have David and Buddy, right? If you could come into the pew behind Alec, right there. Um, well, okay, it's okay. It's fine. Just, just so that we're kind of group. Okay, and Hannah's here as well. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> Good morning. All right, so today we welcome our, into our community the new members who have chosen to make a commitment to this congregation by joining our membership. The new members who have joined or rejoined us between 2018 to the present are in alphabetical order, Elmer, Buddy, and Sharon German, David Jones, Gianni Morasco, Alec Peck, Walt Russell, Kristen Shaughnessy, and Hannah Schwartz-Rausch. New members, we are so glad to have you here with us and that you have chosen this community of fellow seekers to travel with you on your life journeys. We'd like to address the following questions to you and request that you respond at the end. Will you accept our gifts of fellowship, discovery, and service? Will you offer us your unique presence and gifts? Will you add your name to the long history of Unitarian Universalists who spread hope with our living faith? Will you engage with us as we seek to create a community in a world dedicated to love and justice? Please respond. Yes. Congregation, now it's your turn. Will you welcome these new members with the warmth and comfort of your fellowship? Will you seek to add your strengths and talents to the new gifts that they bring to us? Will you share our triumphs and our struggles as our community grows and changes? Yes. Well. So at this point, um, we were going to say the, the covenant of this church together. Um, could we get that back up, Alec? Okay, so let us say together again the covenant of this church, the promise that we make each week to ourselves and to each other, which holds our community together with common purpose and common love in the midst of our beautiful diversity of belief. Love is the spirit of this church. And to dwell to dwell together in peace, to seek truth. Thank you. And now we'd like to acknowledge our new members, if they could come up to the front. Uh, we have present today, 
um, Elmer German, Elmer Buddy German. David Jones, if you could just come up into the front of the pulpit. Just right here, just line up right here. Just, just come up to the front and, and face the audience, okay. Um, Alec Peck. Walt Russell. And Hannah Schwartz Rush. Schwartz Rush. Okay. <laughs> New members, we are so glad to have you here with us and that you have chosen this community of fellow seekers to travel with you. Um, if, if you would like, um, if you just mention your name and add a few words if you'd like at the pulpit. Yes. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me well in this. Um, my name is Hannah, my eldest is also Hannah, and my little one is Balana. We, thank you. Um, we started coming virtually um, during the first set of lockdowns, and it was really great because I finally got to talk to another grown up that wasn't in a children's program, because that's all I was doing uh, for a very long time. So it was a wonderful break from um, that, and great to talk to everyone and I started coming um, right at Easter when we opened back up in person for the first time and I've been coming, yeah, you may hold that, just take it, thank you. And we've been coming um, since and I, I really love it here and I'm really grateful um, to have found you all, so thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Hello, I tend to be mouthy, as you know, so I'll just say, I owe this church. It supplied me with two girlfriends over my youth until now, at age 70, and a wife, and she's long gone. But I, I owe this church and the adventure of uh, Unitarianism. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm probably a familiar face to most of you. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. It's been a really great job uh, to go on this spiritual journey with all of you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to be here uh, so much that uh, I've been let in and, and be part of it. And uh, I, even though I, I want to put a little bit of into it, uh, <clears throat> I like what I'm getting. Hi, by German. I first joined this church, I think it was in 1998. And so I decided to come back and try to give it another 25 years and see what happens. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hannah would also like to say hello. Hello. Do you want to say what you love about being here? Um, you love the toys? I love the toys. You love the people? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you love the people? You want to say thank you? Thank you. Good girl. That was great. Uh, we'd like to get a photo for the newsletter of, of our new members. Um, maybe we could do it um, in the parish hall after the service when things are the more settled down. Okay, did everyone hear that? <laughs> So when the service is over. All right, thank you new members. Thank you to the congregation for welcoming the new members. And this concludes our new member welcome.
If you'd like, you may return to your seats. Thank you so much. Our speaker today, I'd actually like to add something to that, that we are very blessed to have all of you become a part of our church. You contribute um, so much that we can't say thank you enough and welcome. Today's speaker is UUCR member Lee Greer. Lee Greer is an evolutionary scientist, author, and educator. Linda and Lee have been members of the UU Church of Riverside for a number of years. They have three children. Lee has also had COVID, so he will be joining us on our screen. Um, and we hope to see him back soon. From mythos to cosmos, from representational meaning, meaning making and myth making to cosmology making. From our early primate subfamily, hominin ancestors, more than 3 million years ago, through the origin, origin of our genus, Homo, 2 million years ago, and the emergence of anatomical mon, mon, mon energy, I should have read this, practice, 315,000 years ago in Homo sapiens, Sapiens, mankind, and its forebears have used agency detection, personification, representation, representational symbols, and tell telling to model ourselves and our world. As mean making primates, primates, we have structured our representational sense of the universe and ourselves through myth, art, and story our spiritualities, that is the ens essence of our world representations and self-representations, and the search for life's meaning has been there with us long, long before the ancient Greeks ever sought natural causation and first applied math to nature. We have two lightings of the sacred flame. The first is the Occupy Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. The second is the lighting of our own candle, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original peoples of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Kahia, the Capano, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light the sacred flame as stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with the space and opportunity to strive to limb live out our common principles to bring justice equity and compassion into our daily lives to resist all that threatens the earth and her people and to be a part of the world community with peace liberty and justice for all let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together our chalice reminds us that the fire within ourselves is the same fire that illuminates the universe. It is our reminder that all is connected, even though the space of the void is vast, and our experience here is but a blip in the cosmos timeline. This flame is our promise that in our smallness and our short time on this earth, we live intently and deeply with love for one another, with honesty and integrity, to be guided by rational thought and critical thinking, and with a sense of shared responsibility. For as the late astronomer Car Carl Sagan reminds us, this pale blue dot is the only home we have ever known.
We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. We know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others. So I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here for a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic and speak into it directly and clearly so everyone can hear. However, be aware that you will be visible on Zoom, the Zoom camera and in the recording of the service, which is posted online. Do we have any church members who would like to volunteer? Going once, going twice. Okay, I'm gonna have to call on you then. Oh, Alec. Thank you, Alec. Hi, my name is still Alec Peck, uh, and I've been a lifelong UU. I was raised in the UU church by my parents, uh, who were uh, both very humanist in practice. Uh, and when I came of age, uh, I decided uh, I got a chance to choose my own uh, spiritual path. And I really believe in the free and open search for truth and exploring the six sources uh, deeply and each of those uh, speak to me and each of the seven principles and potentially even the eighth principle really speak to me on a deep level. And so I really uh, believe uh, believe in that. And I really love uh, coming here and making myself uh, try for try force myself to be a better person each week. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. That's how it's done. If you're new here, a visitor or an old friend, please raise your hand to stand and come up to the mic in front of the pulpit. If there is someone online who would like to introduce themselves, please raise your hand and we will call on you by Zoom. Please let us know who you are, where you are from, and how you found out about us. Anybody on Zoom, Alec? Okay. For any other new guests, Please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We would love to chat with you out in the parish hall where you can also find the visitor's book. Please use your name and how you can be contacted if you would like to know about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get addition added to the mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Our next hymn is Woyaya, number 1020 in the teal hymnal. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but please only with a mask on. Please stand in the body of spirit and join us in singing number 1020, Woyaya. We are going. Heaven knows where we are going, but we know within. Where we are 
sharing our stewardship. SOS, or sharing our spirit, is a program to help families in need during the holiday season. All of the income from this fundraiser goes into our designated SOS fund. Our goal this year is $2,500. This year's Sharing Our Spirit fundraiser is being held from October 19th and will end on November 27th. Collections will be on the second and fourth Sundays in October and November. Contact our office or administrator, Robert Braun, for more information. Please mark all donations to this fund as SOS. You may write this on the subject line of your check or place cash contributions in the special mark envelopes in the pews and place them into the offertory plate. If you would like, us, like to help us reach more families this holiday season, UUCR will graciously accept monetary contributions and donations of new or gently used toys, clothing, packages of new underclothes, socks, blankets, toiletries, etc. All monetary donations and donated items are tax, tax deductible. Thank you for your support. And then we have the regular offertory. This portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church. This can be accomplished several ways. In addition to the weekly con collection, you may send your checks to the church address, which is shown here and will be shown at the end of the service as well. You may con con contribute by PayPal. Are we using PayPal yet, Kate? Okay, you may contribute by PayPal using a QR code, which is shown here, as well as on the church website and in the newsletter. Also, Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater Brothers cards, which we will have in church each Sunday. You get the full value, and the church also receives a percentage for free. See Dinah Row down here to purchase the gift cards. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Will our ushers now please come forward to receive the collection. Our next hymn is number 402 from you I receive from the gray hymnal feel free to sing as the spirit moves you but please only with a mask on stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn 402 from you I receive
Now, I would like to introduce Lee Greer, speaking to us on From Mythos to Cosmos, from representational mean, meaning making and myth making to cosmology making. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. I just want to make sure everyone can hear my voice and that any levels need, need to be adjusted can be adjusted. Is it confirmed that you can hear me? Good. <clears throat> well, uh, I want to uh, med meditate a few morning, a few minutes this this morning on the long journey that we humans have have taken over the last we and our ancestors over the last three million years, <clears throat> as we have looked out and begun to make sense of the universe we we find ourselves in this is home this is where humankind first appeared in the east african rift valley and um geologically active area an area with rich biodiversity and and our ancestors ancestors of our genus and of our species first walked the earth as <clears throat> as um, facultative bipeds in this location, a mixed lo location of forest and savanna. And, uh, and it's been a very long journey that, that we have taken. One of the first ways that we know that, that, that our ancestors uh, w would represent the cosmos and and represent what they saw around them is 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 the fact of a manuport a, a manuport is is a is a rock or an object just picked up and carried and is altered because it has been handled so much i'm speaking particularly of a manuport from from over 3 million years ago in the australopithecus africanus in a, in a cave in South Africa, the, uh, the Michael Panskett cave. And this is the stone that was carried for several miles from its source rock. And, and it was, and it's naturally formed, but it's been, but it's been carried and worn by, by being held. And it's very interesting because it seems to naturally have a face on it, which resembles the face of our Australopithecine ancestors, <clears throat> which uh, indicates that this was valuable, valuable for no particular reason, except that it, that, it, that it reminded these bipedal creatures of themselves. During the time of, of greatest cranial growth, which it went exponential for a while before our species ever came along. The biggest uh, bit of this growth took took place in in our evolution. We made use of mimetoliths, liths of rocks that that re resemble objects familiar and important to us. <clears throat> Some of the first evidences of of in engravings and of um, symbolic representation that we created that was not simply picked up is is from about a half a million years years ago in a particular cave in java the place where homo erectus was first discovered at trinil in in java and and here are a series of the markings which, which are found there and this has been dated uh, way back you can also see it was a time of tremendous climate change as shown by the by the oxygen 18 proxies for climate change and over this period of time artistic and representational 
handiwork was was being made and in many ways we now know it was a attempt to make sense of the universe around us here is homo erectus of course our um, direct ancestor in the same genus by the different species and then a subspecies neanderthalensis and and our own subspecies sapiens sapiens and these are the periods of time where increasingly these types of representations got more sophisticated. Another very early place was in the southern route of, of migration out of Africa on the Indian subcontinent. And this is at the Bimbetka cave, where a number of these depressions were made in which ochre has been found. And and they are placed in very interesting, they're all about the same size, uh, roughly. You can see about five centimeters across, three, three to five centimeters across. And they seem to have no particular function ex except as something decorative and as wells to, to place colors that would probably be put on the individual. Here are some of them here. This is within the last 250, well, 500,000 to 250,000 years down to the last 50,000 years. Here is a little summary of that. And the first representations of cave painting, of, of course, appeared in the latter part of this time. Now we're going to step back and look at the migration patterns out of Africa as traced by mitochondrial DNA, that is matrilineal DNA and Y chromosome DNA, which is patrilineal DNA out of Eastern Africa, spreading out into Africa, where most of the genetic diversity of humankind is still. There was a Northern route of migrations and a Southern route of migrations. <clears throat> and here is the greatest ex extent of ice during the most uh, recent uh, Pleistocene glacial maximum. Okay, and the migration patterns go follow the areas of available for travel, avoiding the inhospitable areas. Well, what emerged from this is a northern route and a southern route. And it's interesting that our mythologies and our cosmogenies follow these routes, these, these two routes. Now, there have been lots of speculation about the, the sources for human myth. Some of them have, people have looked to the subconscious, like the Freudians did, or the Jungians for some sort of spiritus mundi underlying our very psyche. But as, as usual, the scientific evidence favors something much more satisfactory explanation-wise and, and concrete and tied to the world as we traveled. And essentially, it was two competing cos cosmologies, which have been summarized in, uh, in Michael Witzel's book. He's a Sans Sanskrit scholar pulling together the genetic evidence and, and the linguistic evidence from around the world in a, in a masterful uh, monograph. He showed that there, were, that there was a Southern cosmology. You know, that's my term there. It's a Southern, the Afro-Austro-Melanesian set of my migrations, and then the Afro-Transcaucasian, -trans Eurasian, Amaranth sets of migrations. And these two different types of mythology, the, or, or, or the Northern cosmology, the Southern cosmology, may be contrasted in these ways. The Northern cosmology, which led us much more through areas of the world which, which were catastrophically affected by climate change at the end of the Pleistocene, tended to have a cyclical and destructive type of ring in the cosmology. It starts from chaos. There is a dragon that guards non-being. Heaven and earth are, are like an egg. And then there are generations of deities, the Titans, and then the Olympians versus the Titans. There's the light of the sun, which was hidden, is revealed. 
and the eternal winter gives way to the four seasons. A primordial dragon is slain. By the way, all of this is in the Hebrew Bible too. So, 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 we, so we know that, our, that the Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions arise following the Vedic religions from, from the Northern cosmology. Then you have the creation of humans, which are descendants of the sun god and so forth. You have noble lineages. You have a flood, which was punishment for human and divine hubris. And then there were trickster deities that would bring culture and fire. Local history begins, and then there's a final dis destruction of the world and a, and a cycle of a new heaven and a new earth, a, a cyclical creation and destruction. That's the Northern cosmology. The Southern cosmology emphasizes the eternality of the world. So heaven, earth, sea, we're, we're already there. There is no cosmogony or origin of those structures. There is there's a high deity, uh, sort of a, a deus otiosis, one that is quite removed. So there are intermediate lower deities as there are in the Northern cosmologies, various totems, tricksters, cultural heroes, and, and, and so forth there. There is a primordial age of which, which of course in Australia, which is part of the Southern migrations is called the dreaming. Then you have the creation of humans there. And you also have, even though they're less common, you do have, have flood uh, myths as well. And trickster deities bring culture and fire and wood, and there is no end of, of the world. It's very interesting that these two stories shape, have continued to shape human cosmology actually into the 20th century and, and beyond two competing ways of looking at the universe. <clears throat> now, one of the things that often happened with humans is because we are agency detecting, uh, we have agency detecting brains like, like other mammals do. The very earliest personifications of the universe or of, or of the deity of the earth were, were the uh, Venuses which started almost as basically as old as anatomically modern humans are going, going back over 200,000 years. Um, here are some of, some of the earliest ones from places like the Middle, Middle East and Morocco, where incidentally Morocco is where, is where the oldest anatomically modern humans um, remains have, have been found. Now, uh, these are quite ambiguous to begin with. The, the, the later figurines were, were far less ambiguous. And of course, we're sweeping down over a large periods of time here, down to from, um, from over 100,000 to, to under 50,000, 35,000, 25,000, down to, to uh, 12 and 20,000. And, and further. The, the Venuses continued throughout this period of time down to approximately the, the last uh, glacial maximum as it was wearing off the start of the Holocene about 11,000 years ago at Neuchâtel. Nuch, Here's a summary of the, of the period of Venus representations. We, we call them Venuses, but but they were female representations of the, of the divine and of ultimate reality. Then another group of hybrid characters began to appear. One of them is the, is the Lowen Mensch, the uh, about 35 five to 40,000 began to appear. It's a, it's a uh, more sexually ambiguous, although it tends to be more male. Uh, chimeric character that, that has part human and part other uh, part uh, um, anatomical parts. And, and this is, is connected with a lot of the cave drawings that began to appear in the, in the particularly in the upper Paleolithic, not only in Eurasia, but across the world as, as well within Africa and, and beyond. One of, the, 
representatives of this is, is of course, the sorcerer from, from Le Trois Frères. It's, it's called a sorcerer, but it's actually a divine figure as a point. And what it basically has is, you know, a, a stag's antlers and owl's eyes, a bear's four paws, human legs, a, a patella and feet, and a wolf's or a horse's tail. And ba basically, it is a uh, it is a figure of a divine figure, and from it flow whole bunches of of animals. So it has been called the master of the beasts motif. Occasionally, the mistress of the beasts motif appears as well. Here, here it is, and notice that the game and the wildlife are th are imagined by early humans to emerge from this divine figure here. Now, as, as, as we come down to the time of the first agricultural tran transitions, the agricultural revolution, and the fir first making of cities like in Gebegi Tepli in Asia Minor and so forth, which was about 10,000 years ago and then less to, uh, to 5,500, 6,000 years ago, and, and so forth. We, we continue to see the, the master of beasts, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> master of beasts motif present here, where two wild animals are being tamed by, by a divine figure there. And this is, this is a picture that would per persevere for several thousand more years, it actually has been imported directly into some of our modern religions as well, the, the master of beasts motif. We also began to see an issue of, of um, escalating asymmetrical reciprocity, which is human sacrifice, uh, which happened in different places. This, this particular one happened to be in Oxfordshire, England. Of course, we see the master of beasts within the, the new world come down to, to, to ancient Mesopotamia. The master of, of beast motif is there, ancient Egypt. Um, here, you go from about 6,000 years ago, here is the mistress of beasts giving birth as well. And, and as we trace down, um, uh, you know, 8,000 years down to six, seven, six, and so forth. We see ongoing repeating of this. In some cases, the master of beasts is an iconic, meaning that there, there, there isn't a deity pictured, but there's a living plant or a tree, a sacred tree. Here again, master of beasts from Greek culture, from Gilgamesh, uh, from the ancient, Sumerians there, look at this notice, starting to appear winged creatures as well. Here is Asherah as a mistress of beasts. Uh, this is getting down to about 3,000 um, to 3,200 years, years ago, the, what we would call the late Chalcolithic or the uh, Bronze Age. And of course, in the Bronze Age, there was, there was a plethora of, of these creatures, um, master of beasts or mistress of beasts with winged creatures on, on either side, um, continuing on more cases of them. We could go on and on, even some, some double master of beast creatures. And of course, coming down into the very iconography, which is part of the Judeo-Christian re religion as well, here's, a, here's an ancient representation of, of Yahweh, and there is, the, there is the, uh, the tree of life, as it were, issue. And of course, his consort, Asherah, because God had a wife, then we know this was, this was before, long before rabbinic Judaism. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, within the, the whole Ark of the Covenant idea was again, a, a winged creatures be, between which the deity dwelt, whether it's uh, whether it, whether it's the god Pharaoh on, on his throne, in the case of Tutankhamun, or or so forth. You have the the, the winged cherubim 
on either side representationally and that and that 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 motif con continues down all right so that takes us to some of our cultures i will i i, I won't go into the megaliths um, except to say that they help determine the calendars and the times of planting and all of that what did we think about the 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 stars okay. well our we our ancestors very quickly noticed that the season brought different stars appearing even as the as it went through its diurnal cycle as well as its yearly cycle and that um and that the, that that some of the stars were were wandering stars now if if we go back to a very early time here so i'm backtracking uh, again since we took the little side road with views of the deity um here here we go back and and we find an example this is from about 35,000 years ago um actually a little bit more possibly of of the waxing and waning lunar cycle represented here with the number of of dots there in in a serpentine fashion you also fi find this similar on the border cave in south africa the the kwazulu uh, places as well as representation the, 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 and this has been called the oldest uh, star chart here uh, and as well as a possible representation of the of the hunter orion now if if, if we come to the to the el castillo cave which is about forty thousand years ago down to about thirty four thousand depending on which part of of what is um, uh, dated within the within the cave paintings and all of that it was, it was an area of human habitation for a long time notice that it is also in in a place which could have become uh, rather isolated during the times of glacial advance within the last um, half a million years there have been four major major glacial advances within the northern hemisphere and some very speculative work that that has been done on this has been finding stories within stone with with disc paintings and with human hand stencils as well one of them is quite evocative it looks it looks like the pattern of the northern constellation corona borealis the northern crown um, and and so forth as well as groups of of dots similar to to what was noticed in previous times by by the way something that must be said about this earlier one here is that is that there was is that there was seen to be a link between uh, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, number of days of the year in which the bright bright star in Orion Bet Betelgeuse was 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 visible from southern Africa, and it happens to be very similar to to the uh, in time to the human gest gestational period. So our ancestors linked linked certain astronomical appearances with with human fertility. <clears throat> uh, there are some highly speculative. Um, attempts to see well could they have been visualizing some of the constellations that that we visual visualize now well uh, to return briefly to the ancient mother goddess cult of the venuses what you have here is a crescent being being held in the venus of los los cell in northern france dated to about twenty five thousand years ago and it has 13 distinct marks notches within this crescent which is being 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 held there which is the number of lunar cycles as well as the, the number of human fertility cycles with the, within a year as well <clears throat> now if we go down to the to the to the lasco cave which is under twenty thousand years ago some of some very magnificent paintings have been observed there as well as some interesting 
series of dots, which have been interpreted as, as calendrical 13 dots here plus a blank space. Okay, and then here, 29 dots, which is the lunar cycle. Again, and this, this is half of a lunar cycle, um, meaning from, from new moon to, to close to full, basically, uh, present within these, these cave walls. And then starting to see s some representations also of what may be star groups, as, what, as has been noticed by some of them. For instance, uh, Taurus, the bull, the Pleiades, and the Hyades, two open clusters that, that um, our ancestors could see with their unaided eyes. And, and, uh, and of course, we, we, we now recognize Orion as one of the constellations too. Matter of fact, in the same orientation, you've, you've got a, a bull killing a man in the same orientation that you, that you have there. This is in the Northern area. Here is in the Southern route. Humans very, very much dominate over the animals here. The balance is tipped the other way. So certainly um, the idea of a hunter facing the uh, da dangers of, of, of a world uh, of large animals and uh, very rough climate survival and all of that is, is something that would have been memorable to them. Now, if, if we move down to into, into Mesopotamia where agriculture first started, started there about 4,500 BCE, which is about 6,500 years ago, roughly, you've, you've got a group of people, the, the Sumerians who emerge and the very name Shumer, which in Semitic languages comes from, uh, you know, indicates the heavens, Shem. Okay, or points to to the sky. Um, essentially, there you've, and of course, there's a lot of pointed stone stone markers which are there. They they did some some of the earliest work on on some of these um, understanding of the relations between calendar stars and all of that. Well, here you have the Sum Sumerians. They they linked astronomical events with time for plowing, and all of that. That they they of course also, which was later uh, adapted by by later Mesopotamians, came up with the base six numerical system, dividing the year into twelve months, day into twenty four hours, and the circle into three hundred sixty five degrees. Each degree, of course, subdivided into. 60 arc seconds and arc minutes, and then each arc minute into 60 arc seconds. <clears throat> and they also had had uh, the, the first namings about 2500 BC, which is about 4,500 years ago, of understanding which parts of the sky the sun went through, what, what is called the, the ecliptic. There are 13 constellations, although what is generally recognized are 12 constellations through which the ecliptic passes. And, and many of the names and ideas have been transmitted down to our modern times uh, from the ancient Sumerian. So they called 12 major zodiacal constellations or the constellations on the ecliptic, they called it the shiny herd. Here is here's some of the imagery that came from some of their cylinder seals uh, superimposed on a, a reconstruction of what the sky would look like in about 2,500 years BC, about 40, 4,500 years ago. <clears throat> and you can see that many of the ideas came down. So here's the Mesopotamian from, from, from over 3,000 years, years ago, the view of the water bearer Aquarius, or the Sagittarius, the chimeric archer winged human, Character of the Mesopotamian, the, the Greco Egyptian. By Greco Egyptian, we mean within the Alexandrian period, post Alexander the Great's empire, um, which broke up into a different, different smaller empires. And then, uh, then of course, here's Capricornus, the, uh, the goat fish, ancient Mesopotamian to uh, Greco Egyptian. 
And the Sumerians not only knew about the fixed stars, they also knew about the wandering planets and seemed to represent, it, represent them as, as circling the sun, actually, which is very interesting. Um, they, within a, a number of their artworks, as well as recognizing the set planets all the way out to the farthest one that you can see with the unaided eye, uh, which is Saturn, and even recognize that it had rings, has rings. <clears throat> if we go briefly to, to Egypt, what we find, of course, with, with the pyramids, among many, many, many things that can be found in ancient Egypt, um, one can find that that there was a timing of their calendar to 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 when the dog star, which is associated with the, which is supposed to be the the dog that accompanies the hunter Orion, could be seen through a particular shaft that would give the morning of the, of of the Nile floods, and there have been some who have speculatively suggested that the placement of the three great pyramids is in keeping with the main stars within Orion's belt. Now, if we move to Northern Europe, that's, that's from um, 3,700 years ago, roughly plus. Uh, if we move to, to Northern Europe, Europe in uh, Saxony, we also find, find the, the kind of observations, uh, observational things that would go on there. What you have here is representations of of some of the constellations which was built up over time, as well as the directions of the summer and winter solstice and, uh, and uh, possible representations of Pleiades and so forth. Here is the location where this object was found, which is about 30 centimeters across on top of what was probably a sacred hill at the time and the use it for calendar making purposes. Now, if, if we come down to more modern Mesopotamia at the time of Syria, of Assyria in the sixth century, what we find is the remaking, is the rebuilding of, of a much older um, astrolabe, basically a, 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 uh, an astronomical ins instrument that, uh, from which calendrical data can be gathered and uh, Intense study has shown that it actually fits for much earlier, about 5,300 years down to 5,100 years ago, and may even mark the uh, reconstruction of the Kufel's impact ev ev event, which went, which landed up in Austria, but which would have been, uh, which was apparently observed by Sumerian um, sky gazers at that time and memorialized within this within this tablet which of course has been trans translated and um, de decoded over time okay well now we get our common names of course the names of most of our stars are arabic in origin because of the way information was transmitted across the middle ages and before but the greeks were the ones who who systematized, they basically inherited the constellations from others and systematized them. You've got some mention of them in the formative period of the, um, of the Afro Transcaucasian, Eurasian, Amaran, Northern cosmology as it influenced uh, Greek, loose Greek culture in the eighth century. Of course, this is the time of, of, of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and of course of, of Hesiod. And, and there, of course, you've got the cosmology coming from chaos and so forth and going through a series of ages, which this later influenced um, uh, Judeo-Christian -Christ, uh, apocalyptic thinking too. And what, what you have is, is a second century CE reproduction in the Farnas, atlas of a much earlier um, sculpture, which, was, which probably came from the, from the second century before the common era. And it's a sculpture of one of the mythical titans in the uh, northern cosmology, 
called Atlas holding the celestial sphere. And what's very interesting about this is that all of these are backwards from what you would actually see in the sky. It's sort of a God's, God's eye view looking down on the celestial sphere from the outside. You have to flip, flip it over to have it where you can recognize the, the, the constellations as they would appear in the sky after reverting it. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, <clears throat> in, inverting it there. Uh, the constellations have been brought to us, of course, Eudoxus of, Pani of, of Canidios in Asia Minor. He, all of his works are lost, but they were captured within the poem of Aratus of Soli and his poem Phenomena, which, which brings it down, of course, was later on Hipp Hipparchus, and then finally in Claudius Ptolemaeus's Almagest for the 44 constellations, um, which we have inherited from, from the Greek uh, on down into our time. Now, if, if, if we come from just before that time, between the time of er Eratus and after Hipparchus, bef before Ptolemaeus, we have the Dendera sky chart, which is from, which, uh, is, uh, from um, Alexandrian Egypt. There, there's a representation of it. One can see it there, there, there is the ecliptic. And most of the constellations are recognizable. A couple of them aren't, but most of them are. And, and you have actual ev ev events recorded there, like, like a lunar e eclipse of 52 BC, and then a, then a solar e eclipse of 51, which are, which are memorialized within, within the Dendera calendar, within the Dendera. And of course, you come all the way down to our time, past uh, Johannes Bayer's um, Uranometria, which gave us our, our Greek way of naming stars by their magnitude, by Greek letters, alpha being the brightest on down further from that. And in the age of exploration, we, we had uh, the, some of the cartographers made further developments on that. And, um, and of course, 1922, the International Astronomical Union went ahead and recognized 88 constellations. These ones are Johannes Bayer's representations of 12 southern constellations, which couldn't be seen by, by the ancients. So, so they would, uh, so taking information from explorers, he inclu included that in, in his Uranometria um, to, to represent it there. Now, what is interesting, and I think I want to end it about here, is that, is that what we have done as humans has been to make sense of the world first by looking up into the sky. And I mentioned that, that the Greeks first applied, uh, I mean, that there was a time when the Greeks began to search for, for natural explanations. It's called the Ionian Dawn, and uh, it's between the fourth and the second centuries before the Common Era. But they weren't, of course, the first to, to actually apply math to the, uh, to the heavens, they just were the, the first to do it in the sense of, a, uh, of seeking a natural explanation. It had been applied far, far before when the first calendar makers back in Paleolithic times first began to make those observations and first began to tell stories about how we got here. And of course, our spirituality and our journey um, in many ways follows all of that. And I, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lee. That was amazing. Our closing hymn is My Life Flows On in Endless Song um, from the Gray Hymnal number 108.
Lee, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but. Um, yes, I can. If you would like me, I don't know how your voice is. You're up for the benediction, but if you're a little off, I can read something. Either way. Feel free to read something. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and read something. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Thank you, Lee, for sharing your valuable time and insights with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated and we look forward to seeing you again. For those of you who would like to stay in the sanctuary, um, Lee, are you up for some discussion? Sure. Okay, then we will have 10 to 15 minutes of discussion or observation from the service. Please remain in the sanctuary or online. Please be aware that these comments will be posted online. For the rest of you, you are now welcome to join into the parish hall. All right, comments, if you come up to the mic. Bill Casey. Two questions, I guess. The first is when you had the master of beasts and those winged creatures. Could those have been considered a forerunner, a forerunner of the idea of an angel? Yeah, yes. That's right. So it's a beginning of a look of the uh, chains of rule and command that later on helped uh, forge the idea of gods rather than uh, spirits that if you had some right word that those uh, winged beings would come and uh, be friends and uh, perhaps servants and do what you ask them to do. Yeah, the whole idea of winged messengers, creatures, cherubim, all of that comes comes from the long tradition of the master of beasts, as far as I can see. And you know, have, from the evidence I tried to summarize this morning, I what? should say. What was that last? Oh, from the evidence I, I tried to summarize this morning, correct? Yeah. And Anshara was the proto wife of Yahweh before. Uh, uh, she gets sort of subtracted and becomes either the Holy Spirit or just uh, not mentioned because they wanted a nice, solid war god. And so they... That's correct. The idea of him having linkages to other uh, beings. Yes, cor correct. Uh, Yahweh has an archaeological origin down in the south of the syro palestine area down in the southern deserts there and uh and uh he is linked in early early inscriptions with with asherah who was kind of a royal consort yeah well thank you anybody else alec Thank you very much, Lee, for speaking with us today. Uh, I didn't have any specific uh, questions, but uh, one of the topics for the Chalice Circle at uh, the ULV Church this week is uh, cycles. And I thought it was very interesting, your comment about, uh, about the uh, early recognition between uh, or the um, correlation that people made between uh, the biological cycles uh, of our bodies and the cycles of the seasons. Um, uh, and of course, uh, there are several re good reasons why those are, are linked uh, together. And so uh, I was thinking that sort of uh, perhaps gives me a bit more of an appreciation for astrology, uh, that it does kind of make sense uh, to, uh, because uh, the earth <laughs> rotates with the stars and the earth is what dictates 
uh, all of our sort of internal cycles, it kind of makes sense to sort of uh, correlate those in a way. Right, right. Well, of, of course, the, the astrological signs which are in the various horoscopes are because of the precession of, of Earth's orbit are off. And there are 13 constellations through which the ecliptic passes, not, not 12. But, and of course, that is always changing. But what it does show is, is, our, is our ability to, to look for agency uh, and meaning to try to, to, to detect what hidden intentions there may be out there governing our, our uh, lives and all of that. And that's certainly what astrology brought that took the discoveries of astronomy basically and 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 brought that mystical aspect to that yeah anybody else walt at one point in your talk there was something about a giant uh, meteor, I think, was that the meteor that destroyed, uh, was responsible for the, the destruction of all of the, um, the dinosaurs? I, no. Okay. Yeah, if yeah, you, that, but, that was... Uh, I found that quite interesting. I was wondering if you could expand on that. But, but, right, right. Yeah, that, that, that was, what destroyed the dinosaurs was about 66 million years ago, 65 million years ago. That was a long time ago and a much more destructive, vast... Um, impact this 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 was a smaller impact which which took place in europe about 5500 or about 5100 years years ago um which is called the the Kofels event and and a series of researchers thought that they found felt from the calculations and translations and so forth that they found evidence that sumerian astronomers documented that event. Bill? Oh, oh okay. You have to wait. Pat? Um, good morning. Hello, everybody from Sicily. Um, I'm having a good trip, but this has been amazing. Wow, Lee. I really appreciate your putting this together. Um, when we were in Spain, we saw cave paintings, but I don't know how to put that together. Um, but just, um, I'm so glad there are people who are studying all this stuff and making it available to understand our roots. I'd love to understand how the brain evolved and how language evolved. It's just incredible. And yes. why we're not nicer, given that. <laughs> yes, we have lots of reasons to be nicer because the other doesn't give very good payoffs, right? So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. In the long term, it's, um, yeah. But um, if I can be political for a second, since I'm far away, um, things are better today than they were a week ago. Maybe, maybe um, the, our worst nightmares are not going to happen. And Mitch McConnell will be history. <laughs> Wouldn't that be incredible? <laughs> All right, that's enough. I shouldn't do that. Anyway, hello, everybody. Meditation, it, make sure you tell Bud German meditation is going to be at Thursday at, at 10. The Mallory's and Linda and Adam and Lauren come to that. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna have it this week. And I'm gonna be going up to Mount Baldy. So I may be already meditating a whole lot before I come to that meeting. Anyway, good to see everybody. It's amazing how much I've missed you. Oh. Where are you? Take care. Sicily. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> You're welcome. 
Anybody else? Oh, Bill, you got something else. Do we have anybody else before Bill? Okay. Notice something else. It seems that the trickster spirit, which seems to be, you had two of those proto stretches a long time back. Did the trickster spirit in Palestine get transformed into uh, 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 Shaitan, the, the opposition? Did uh, the, the trickster, or did, does the trickster show up when you only have enough resources to where you can waste them on trickery, on playing the trick. Well, in mythology, the tricksters appear in different locations, different contexts. Sometimes they're viewed as in positive light, sometimes they're viewed in a negative light within what later developed within within Judaism, which of course gave, birth, gave rise to Christianity and Islam as a parent religion. Um, the way that Yom Kippur worked was that, was that a, uh, a sacrifice was essentially made to, and a transferring of the guilt of the people to, to, the, to a desert demon um, in the Yom Kippur, in the scapegoat ceremony. So, yeah. You can see the re you can see the parallels that happened in many in many of those religions from from that time. There are lots of parallels. Sure. It seems though that for the Amerindians, it's yeah, coyote or um, um, uh, any of those other guys is going to do their thing, and you trick the trickster. Whereas in the Middle East, it's more like. The trickster is against the common order. The common order feeds us. We live in a desert. We can't afford this crud. So it's time to drive the trickster out in howling into the sands. And you do not interact. You do not interact with the tree. You get well, you actually do because, because the scapegoat ritual was a tricking of the trickster. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have a look at that one. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Anybody else? Ah, uh, yes. The the new members, if you would come up so that Bill can have a... Oh, we have another comment? Yeah. Yes, just one thing. Uh, um, Anne Rice had uh, someone in her book that says that mammals look at things and put me meaning into it. And I've also heard that mythos is part true and part not true. Um, I understand. So yeah, go ahead. That just us, or is it true? Well, mythos. This is. These are basic patterns. Uh, I mean, it's a Greek word, mythos, right? Uh, and it's and it is the stories, the patterns, and the values, and attitudes that we tell stories about that that are important to us. So, in other words, um, there there's something something very ancient about mythos. Uh, they also came up with the word cosmos, which which means the, the universe as ordered as we understand it. Of course, not to be confused with. Whatever our cosmology is, it's not to be confused with the way the universe actually is, but although we tend to forget that sometimes, but um, but basically it's it's a way in which we put order and meaning on on our past, on our lives, on the forces in our lives. That's what myth, mythos is, and cosmos is our attempt to to uh, to find the order of the external world outside of us. So we're still there, huh? We're still there. I mean, right now I see, I see in the news that there's a, some sort of signal coming from us from a, a million years, you know, ago that came, came to us. 
So are we doing that too? Well, well, million. So it's important to say about mythos is is these are stories that we have created. So there, because there's a pejorative value to, I mean, meaning to mythos as well, meaning things that we came up with and that as we discover more, we have to get behind the myth to, to see what the reality is too. So that, that, that part can't be forgotten. That's also a valuable part because we create the myth, the, the mythos, just as we also create the cosmos, as we create the, uh, our models of what the world is. Again, not to be confused with the way the world actually is, you know. So these are tools that we use to, to try to make sense of the, of the world and of our place in it. Yeah, it's good. It's fun. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, pictures for those new people, please stay. Um, and if there is no other comments, we now can move into the parish hall for further fellowship. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lee, again. Thank you. <laughs>